Hello, Wellness Friends. Today, I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. Victor Marwin. He is an orthopedic surgeon in Lexington at Bluegrass Orthopedics, and he specializes in upper extremity surgeries. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about carpal tunnel and some uh, shoulder issues and other issues that he'll uh, get into uh, later on. But uh, Dr. Marwin, thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. Thanks and, for me. and welcome to Lexington. Thank you. Yeah, I see patients primarily in Lexington, but uh, I'm also in our Georgetown office one day a week as well. So. Fantastic. So we're here today to talk to you about a technique that is for carpal tunnel release mm -hmm. that doesn't require general anesthesia. And I guess you get your patients back to activity a lot quicker. So that's something kind of new. Can you tell me a little bit about what that technique is and, and how you uh, how you do, uh, utilize it? Sure. Yeah. I've um, so I've I've performed carpal tunnel releases most ways that that are kind of acceptable in, in modern hand surgery. Uh, the traditional uh, carpal tunnel release is an open procedure. Um, it involves making a cut on the palm from approximately here to here through the skin and through the underlying soft tissue, getting down to the constrictive uh, anatomic structure, which is the transverse carpal ligament. So. The transverse carpal ligament runs across this part of the hand, uh, and it's the constrictive uh, anatomic structure in, in carpal tunnel syndrome. So everybody has a carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel syndrome is when that uh, the pressure inside of that tunnel um, prevents blood flow to the median nerve. It, it, it essentially chokes off blood supply and oxygen to that nerve, and as a result, uh, patients have numbness, tingling, paresthesias, which are, that's the doctor term for kind of funny feeling in the fingers that can include burning, itching. Um, and it's essentially, it's, it's nerve damage. You know? So you're, you're, you're you know, crushing that nerve. And as a result, that nerve goes to sleep. It doesn't work well. You can have ischemic changes over time. So that nerve can, you know, parts of it can, can kind of die and, and, you know, not work well. And some of these changes can be permanent depending upon how long they have carpal tunnel syndrome. But essentially... The pressure on that nerve over time is what leads to the, the symptoms of, of carpal tunnel syndrome. Right. Can anybody get carpal tunnel syndrome? Is that is there are people more prone to it than others? Yeah, it's more common in women. Okay. Um, and it's typically you know we typically see it as people as people age more. We see it more commonly as people age. Um, I will tell you, I've treated younger people in their twenties uh, okay. with with carpal tunnel syndrome. It's it's more rare. My typical patient is typically you know forties, late thirties, early forties up through any age. So it's, it's, it's more common as people age. So if, if people are experiencing something with their, with their hand and they're, they're experiencing some numbness or pain or something like that, and you were saying that if you don't address it, the nerve can possibly die or you can have some long-term or permanent problems. Is that correct? You can. It, it typically starts off you know, as milder symptoms, occasional numbness, typically activity-related you know, certain times. Uh, when you're doing certain activities, can, they, they can, it can be provoked. Typically, wrist flexion and extension activities, um, uh, sleep, nighttime symptoms. Um, and the reason there is uh, it's twofold. So it can be positional. So if you're flexing your wrist a lot and you're, you're actually pushing that nerve against the ligament, you're increasing pressure on that nerve. Um, and then when you go to sleep, your blood pressure goes down and the blood supply to that nerve decreases. So people, people feel the, the symptoms a little bit more when they sleep. As well, people can sometimes sleep in funny positions. You know, they, right. can, they can curl up with a blanket and do one of these moves, and they're 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 further compressing the nerve. So, it's multifactorial. Um, it typically starts off as milder numbness and tingling that's intermittent, um, and then it can progress to uh, you know more uh, long term daytime um, symptoms. You know, people say oh, it's, it happens part of the day, and then it's most of the day, and then it's all the time. And um, numbness and tingling can progress to pain. Um, and what that is, is it's really a, you know, a progression of the, of the compression of the nerve and it's compression of the nerve over time. And as that happens, the nerve suffers more and um, it, uh, it absorbs more, more, more trauma, more of, more of an ischemic injury. And, and some of it can be irreversible. In fact, if you ignore carpal tunnel for too long, you can start having muscle atrophy of the muscle of the thumb. And um, that is permanent. That, that typically doesn't come back. So does, does carpal tunnel affect the entire hand or just... Uh Certain fingers? Is just, it? Yeah, just certain fingers. So it's the median nerve. The median nerve is, is the nerve that's compressed in carpal tunnel syndrome. There are other nerves that control sensation of the hand, but the median nerve is responsible for the sensation of the thumb, the index, the middle finger, and then half of the ring finger. So people will typically describe 
numbness in these three fingers and they'll say, ah, my ring finger a little bit too, but I can kind of feel over on this side, that's a different nerve. The ulnar nerve uh, uh, supplies the sensation to that side and that's a, that's a different nerve. Okay, so you were saying that the old way was making an incision from here to here. Now, you, your way is not quite like that, correct? Not quite like that. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a very generous incision. I will tell you that traditionally when this was done, you know, in the 1960s, 1950s, certainly an incision like that, you know, was, was not uncommon. Um, uh, you can look in the medical textbooks and kind of see massive incisions for this. It's shrunk to a mini open incision when, when we're talking about the open incision. It's typically from about there to there. Okay. Depending upon, you know, body habitus, the need for exposure, surgeon preference. Um, so it's an incision. Uh, it's still, you know, relatively large compared to what I do. Um, I've done many carpal tunnels, you know, through an open incision, um, but I do primarily uh, minimally invasive carpal tunnel surgery. Okay, so minim minimally invasive means just basically one opening, correct? Like a small puncture opening? Yeah, it means, uh, so I utilize a device, uh, either an endoscopic knife or an ultrasound knife uh, in order to instrument the carpal tunnel from the inside. So when you're, when you're doing an open procedure, you have to get down to the ligament, which is the constrictive uh, anatomic structure. So if you come from the outside, you have to go through the skin, through the subcutaneous tissue and the fascia to get down to the ligament. You right. see that transverse carpal ligament, then you divide it. And that's the constrictive structure in right. carpal tunnel. Um, Endoscopic carpal tunnel has been around since about the late 90s, early 2000s. Okay. It was kind of popularized at that time. Um, and that utilizes uh, a transverse incision uh, proximal to the carpal tunnel, so closer uh, to, uh, than the actual carpal tunnel. And allows you to get under the fascia and under the ligament and use a camera and a knife uh, to cut the ligament from the inside. And when you right. cut the ligament from the inside, you're sparing the structures on top. So there, there's fewer layers you have to go through. Um, it's uh, it's minimally invasive right. by, by nature of, of the approach. Um, and the idea, the reason why it was developed is, you know, we thought, hey, can we get people back to activity faster? Can they have a quicker recovery? Can they have less pain? Because we're, we're doing less damage in order to approach the thing that we need to release. Um, and then there's newer technique, which, which I do as well, uh, which is an ultrasound guided technique, which is a similar approach to the endoscopic technique, but it requires a smaller incision. And that's simply because the device is smaller. There's, okay. no, there's no camera. So uh, an endoscopic technique utilizes a, a small fiber optic camera to be part of the knife and part of the device that goes into the carpal tunnel. Uh, using ultrasound eliminates the need for a camera. The device is smaller, it's thinner. And that is actually done through an even smaller incision that's about four millimeters um, right in this area. And it allows me to slide a thinner device inside of the carpal tunnel and I use an ultrasound probe to visualize the structures. So the old technique, people had a little longer of a recovery than the new technique. What is the kind of the difference between the sure. recoveries? Yeah, it, it's, it's really variable. Um, traditionally, people, um, and things that I've heard in my practice currently, um, you know, people that have been indicated for an open carpal tunnel, their, their surgeon will typically recommend they take weeks off of work. Um, and you have to understand the anatomy of the hand in order to really appreciate why that is. If you're making an incision, you know, right around there through all the layers, um, this part of the hand sees a lot of stress. So when you're gripping, when you're manipulating things, the tendency is to try and spread this tissue. That the forces applied to the palm will, will sort of spread that. If you have an incision there, you have to take time off uh, and really let that heal. You don't want to widen your incision. You sure. don't want to put stress on those structures. You could have some delayed healing. The wound could break down. You could, you could make yourself more likely to have an infection. Um, by taking the incision and moving it off of the weight-bearing portion of the hand back here in this area for an endoscopic carpal tunnel or back here for an ultrasound-guided carpal tunnel, um, it really allows you to, to put your incision in an area that's not a weight-bearing portion of, of, of the upper extremity. So you don't do much with this part of your hand. Right. Um, you're not gripping. It's out of the way. Um, if, you're, if you have to wash your hands, it's out of the way. You can, it's, it's easily covered with a Band-Aid. Um, most people have it covered with their shirt sleeves in this colder weather. Um, so it's really not an issue. And, and you do have a little bit of soreness in the palm here because we are cutting the ligament, but the overlying structures, the overlying two layers are still intact. So patients can get back to activities a lot faster. Um, to get back to your original question, you know, oftentimes I hear uh, from patients that have come to me for a second opinion. Um, you know, they say, you know, for instance, I had a young laborer who was in his early 30s who needed both sides done. And he uh, saw a different orthopedic surgeon who correctly uh, indicated him for carpal tunnel releases on both sides and said, you're, you're going to have to take about six weeks off of work. Um, and I would do one side and then I would do the other side. Um, the reason 
is you it's really hard to have both hands bandaged sure. uh, and have a fresh wound under there for self-care, bathroom purposes, things sure. like that. You know, it's it's kind of not something you want to do. Um, so you would do one side, then stage the other, and he would need a minimum of six weeks off from work. This is a guy who worked in maintenance. He turned a lot of wrenches, used a hammer, things like that, um, and he just couldn't do it. Uh, and I actually did surgery on, uh, on a family member of his who referred him to me. Uh, and we talked about minimally invasive techniques, and he had a week of vacation coming up from work. So we talked about doing bilateral simultaneous releases, um, and I will consider that for patients where that's kind of a necessity uh, because of work needs or, or other needs. Um, so I did both of his sides at the same time. His incision was back in this area, off of his hand, um, really allowed him to have bandages here only so he could still use his hands for self-care issues. Um, and he, you know, took a week off from work and, and recovered wow. um, and went back to doing maintenance work six or seven days later. Um, I will tell you that most of my patients uh, that I do ultrasound technique on, I allow them to go back to normal activities as tolerated. So I, I typically, I'm a little more conservative. I'll tell them, you know, take a day off, take it easy. Um, they can use the fingers right away. So you'll have a, a bandage on for about 24 to 48 hours, and then you can take it off and wash your hand with soapy water. Um, but I let them go back to activities of daily living immediately. So when they go home from surgery, they can use their fingers for putting their jacket on, for, you know, moving a coffee cup around their kitchen, light, light sort of activity. Um, office work immediately. Um, higher demand physical activities within a couple of days. Is this an outpatient procedure? Yes, it's outpatient and uh, hopefully soon to be office-based. Really? Yeah, here in the office. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, in my training, um, we did most of them in the office. Okay. Um, and it really is just a, a matter of getting the logistics together, but uh, it's absolutely appropriate for the office. It's kind of the perfect procedure for the office. Um, so patients can come in, have it done all under a local anesthesia. Uh, no need for general anesthesia, no need to stop uh, anticoagulation, no need to stop any other medication. There's no need to have uh, preoperative clearance. So patients that are uh, more higher risk patients that have like perhaps COPD or some heart issues, you know, they're not being put to sleep in a, in a hospital or a surgery center. They don't have to have medical clearance. It's kind of like going to the dentist. They're wide awake. Um, they stay wide awake the whole time and they don't really feel anything except for the needle going in to numb them up. Can we control the pain with just over-the-counter meds? Typically, yeah. So in most of my patients, um, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories such as Motrin and Naproxen are appropriate, Tylenol as well. Um, some of my patients, uh, I offer uh, a steroid dose pack to decrease the post-operative inflammation if they can take steroids. Uh, and sometimes I prescribe uh, an anti-inflammatory. I almost never prescribe narcotics. Sure. Yeah. Well, you're being very humble, but I think that this is a bigger deal than people realize because you're, you're that guy, six weeks versus seven days. Yeah, is that's that's, well, that's that's well that's really a for a lot of people that's a really big yeah. deal and then not to be under the general anesthesia a yeah. lot of people are frightened of that i agree and look you know my anesthesia colleagues will tell you that general anesthesia is safe but uh, and i agree you know i put a lot of patients sure. to sleep under general anesthesia for a myriad of other procedures that i perform um, but it's unnecessary for this you don't have to do it um, same thing with cutting all of the tissue in order to get down to the ligament you don't have to do it. It's, not, it's you know, I don't have to hurt you that much. Right. I don't have to pump you full of chemicals to right. have you go to sleep for it. So, so why do it, right? And then, you know, six weeks off of work or four weeks off of work or whatever versus a couple of days, um, you know, time's our most valuable resource, sure. right? So my time's important. Your time's important. Everyone's time is important, right? It's the... It's the, the great equalizer is time, right? It's, it's, our, it's our most valuable resource, as I said. It's and, the commodity that we all have the same of. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or not the same or of. Or not but, the same of. We just don't know how much we have. So I don't like to waste anyone's time. Um, and if I can get you back to doing anything faster, I'm happy, right? So whether it's work, whether it's golf, whether it's caring for a, you know, a grandchild. I have, a, I have a lot of patients that you know are um, grandparents that have become nannies uh, for their grandchildren. Sure. Kind of like my mom did when I was a resident uh, and a fellow. Um, I certainly appreciate that. Um, and no matter what the activity is, I like getting you back to stuff like that faster. And it's really satisfying having patients, you know, the next day have their symptoms significantly better or gone. Uh, and then they tell me, you know, I'm back to doing normal stuff. I have patients, you know, tell me that they played in a golf tournament five days later, wow. uh, you know, played 36 holes or, 
you know, got back to work within a couple of days. I, I love those stories, you know, so it's just, it's very rewarding. Well, you, uh, you actually brought in a couple of your tools that you yeah. use. Would you, would you mind showing those to oh, us to, so, yeah. that, so that we can see actually how small or sure. they are? Yeah, I brought two of the minimally invasive tools that I use. Uh, and again, this is when I was talking about the camera device. This is a, uh, a camera knife. Um, that I've used many, many times. Um, and again, this comes in through an incision right here and it slides into the carpal tunnel. And this allows me to instrument the knife uh, from the inside. Um, this is just the knife portion. This is a demo, a demo uh, piece of equipment. A camera hooks up to the back of this okay. in the operating room. So if I were doing this in the operating room, um, there'd be a big camera on the back of it that you know, was fiber optic and hooked up to a, a high def monitor that allowed me to look at the structures inside the carpal tunnel. Um, this is great. Uh, it's, a, it's a great minimally invasive technique. It does require me to have a tourniquet on you, mm -hmm. uh, which is another pain generator. It's, it's harder to do that in an office, although it can be done. Um, and it's a little tougher for patients to tolerate because you have a pneumatic tourniquet squeezing either here on your forearm or here up on your bicep that's cutting off the blood flow to your arm. And the reason why you have to cut off the blood flow to the arm is so that I can see. Right. Um, you know, we're making a skin incision. There's gonna be a little bit of bleeding. Uh, and that can obscure the, the view of the ligament. So the camera, uh, the camera technique necessitates uh, a tourniquet. Okay. Um, and it can, you know, it's only up for a couple of minutes. Patients can tolerate it wide awake um, if, if we kind of prep them for it. Um, but it is, it is another pain generator. It's another thing that we have to do. It's another, it's another factor in the surgery. Um, but uh, the ultrasound knife is another one that I use. This is what I use more often, quite honestly. I found that this is, the outcomes are outstanding. Uh, the incision is smaller. People are thrilled with it. There's no tourniquet necessary, so I don't I don't have to put a, a tourniquet on your arm at all. You can just have a local injection, be numbed up right here. You don't feel the incision when I when I uh, make a little four millimeter incision to put the device in. The device goes in kind of in the same area and it slides into the carpal tunnel. These balloons, these clear balloons that you see here inflate to move important structures out of the way. They move the nerve and the artery out of the way and create more space for a safe surgery. And then the knife glides in the path in a similar fashion to the other knife. Um, but what this allows me to do is this allows me to do it uh, with ultrasound visualization. So the, the key differences between these two techniques, um, with a camera, you're using a camera to look at the ligament that you're cutting. Um, you don't directly see the other structures yeah, I mean, you can see the nerve if you move the camera a little bit, um, but you typically don't see the other structures that you're on the lookout for or that you don't want to disturb, um, like the artery that, that is in the field or, you know, the nerve that's, that's, that's next to the camera. Again, you can turn the camera and kind of look at it if you want to to check the position, but it's kind of uh, safety by exclusion. So you're just looking at the ligament. The great thing about ultrasound uh, is that it really affords me a new level of safety. So I can, at the exact same time, look at the nerve, I can look at the arteries, uh, and I can see the ligament in real time, all on the same monitor. Right. So it, it gives me a great view of every structure that I'm interested in, and it allows me to, to release the, the ligament well, and um, you know there, there are things that I check and I verify to make sure that the ligament gets a good release, and I feel very satisfied with it. And quite honestly, my patients are, are very pleased. You know? So once a, once a patient, uh comes to see you and, and you're going to do the procedure. Actually, how long does the, does the procedure last? Does it last a long time or not so long? Uh, the, the length of the actual procedure? Yeah. Yeah, um, the, the procedure itself is pretty quick. The procedure itself, if you want to, if you want to talk about, you know, the actual business of the procedure, it's about ten minutes or so. Wow. Um, the whole experience for the patient is a little bit less, is a little bit longer than that. So the patient has to come into either the office or the surgery center uh, right now, I'm doing most of these in a surgery center. Again, we're trying to transition to the office, but uh, and we will be actually running a pilot soon of uh, doing uh, certain patients in the office for okay. uh, for a research project. Um, but you know, they can expect about an hour to an hour and a half experience by the time they come in. They do some paperwork, they check in, they get numbed up. You know, they get in line, we get them into the room, uh, we do their procedure, we wrap them up, and then since there's no general anesthesia, uh, we check out is very fast. So. As soon as they roll out of the operating room or the procedure room that we're doing this in, um, it's typically a quick couple of questions with a nurse, uh, and then they're on their way. You know, we don't have to wait for them to recover, right. so they don't have to come out and void and you know be oriented. There you are. So, and and again, 
in the procedure room, the patient and I are typically having a good time. So sure. it's it's another 10 minutes of face-to-face time with me where you pick out the music you want to listen to and, you know, I put it on Spotify and we're like having fun with whatever musical selection you want to listen to. We're chatting. We're talking about whatever you want to talk about. If you don't want to talk, we don't. Um, otherwise, I'm talking to you about your post-operative course, what you can expect, and things like that. And, you know, quite honestly, it's it's one of the most satisfying things that I do because it's, it's, a, it's a fun time. And it's... it's very very fun for the patient too they get they you know they uh any any level of sort of anticipation and nervousness that i have that i have typically fades away pretty quick when they realize that it's, it's pretty well i think what our viewers can take away from this is that uh, the anxiety level when you talk about surgery the anxiety level for a lot of people just saying that word creates it, certain feelings of anxiousness but this it is a surgery, mm-hmm. but at the same time, if you can say, well, we could potentially do it in the office, uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a game changer in my opinion. So, I agree. Um, it, it is from, you know, and that's, that's one of the goals here is to decrease that anxiety level, right? So, again, I do a lot of these in the surgery center. We're going to start transitioning to the office uh, very soon, actually. Um, and even if we were to do this in the surgery center with a patient, the level of anxiety decreases significantly. Um, there's there's not a lot of scariness that's typically associated with a with a, a bigger procedure. And, you know, research out there will show that a lot of people just don't have their carpal tunnel uh, addressed. They don't want to see somebody for it because you know they're scared of the surgery. They're scared of a of a big approach. They're scared of post operative pain. They're scared of being out of work. All those factors are mitigated by this. And these are the talks that I have with patients uh, before surgery when they come to see me. And these are the talks that you know. These are conversations like that with people like you right. because these are the barriers to keeping people from that keep people from coming to see me. Yeah. You know, they may have had an aunt or a, some other relative or neighbor that you know had a, a traditional carpal tunnel. And they're like, oh, you know, I had some pain afterwards and I was out of work for weeks. It's one of my favorite surgeries to do, quite honestly. Uh, I really. Some people sit, think it's boring uh, doing carpal tunnels. I love it. Uh, patients are very satisfied. I really enjoy them coming back and, and telling me how well they're doing. Um, it's technically a demanding surgery the way that I do it. Not a lot of people have the requisite skill to, to utilize the ultrasound the way that I do. Right. Um, and it was certainly, uh, there, was a, there was a lot of education uh, on, on my side of things that went into it, learning it from my mentors um, when I was training. And uh, it's, it's very rewarding, though. It's become, it's become one of my favorite things to do. But it's not the only thing you do no, because you, you handle the upper extremities. So we want to right. talk a little bit about maybe a shoulder, shoulder uh, uh, issues, shoulder replacement. There's new techniques in shoulder sure. surgery as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about? Uh, yeah. yeah, so I'm a, I am a, a hand and upper extremity surgeon. So if you want to simply talk about everything that I do, the best way to describe it is that I take care of almost everything from the shoulder to the fingertip. Okay. So I do... Um, I do shoulder replacements uh, and shoulder arthroscopy. Um, a, a passion of mine is shoulder arthroplasty or shoulder replacements for uh, older patients that have that have arthritis. Uh, okay. Do you have an age limit? Uh, no, no, there's no, no age limit. Because no. that's so, you know you a lot of patients go yeah. with a shoulder issue, and the surgeon will say, "Well, you're a little too old." Yeah, I mean, for me, age is a number. Um, and, and that's about it. You know, there's physiologic age, there's there's chronologic age. And Bingo. Those, those are different. Absolutely. You know? So, you know, uh, uh, an 80-year-old patient that is very active or, you know, even uh, I've taken care of, again, this is not specific to shoulder, but even carpal tunnel patients in their 80s and 90s. Um, that's not a no automatically. You know, it, it really depends on the patient. And uh, there's, there's definitely benefits that even patients in those age groups with very profound disease can can have, uh, you know, with a surgical procedure. It might be different than the type of benefit they would get if they had surgery when they were in their 60s or 70s, but it's still an opportunity to make them better. And these are the types of conversations that I have with patients. But uh, getting back to your original your original question, your original prompt, I take care of everything from the shoulder to the fingertip for the most part. All right, so anything that would be seen in in a, in a private practice orthopedic clinic, right? So. Um, I take care of fractures, so if you have a wrist fracture or a forearm fracture, uh, uh, an upper arm fracture, um, I treat those. I treat arthritis, so worn out joints, specifically in the shoulder and in the hand. Um, nerve compression, like carpal tunnel, there's yeah. a couple other ones like cubital tunnel uh, that, I, that I also take care of, tendon problems. 
really, you know, most things that have, that that people have wrong with their with their entire arm. You know, I can take. Uh, well, we do want to talk about the the sure. shoulder arthroscopy, but you mentioned arthritis, and I just want to put something out there for our viewers. Is is there anything new? in the horizon for people with arthritis? Sure. Uh, is there some things that uh, you could talk to the yeah, viewers uh, about? Sure, certainly, yeah. There are, there are a couple of new things uh, that, are, that are kind of, uh, I guess, kind of newer on the horizon technologies or techniques, really. Um, you know, as far as, far as shoulder arthritis goes, um, you know, the mainstay of treatment for shoulder arthritis is conservative treatment until it stops working. And then Really, when a when a joint is worn out, there's not much to do except for replacement, right? right? So arthroplasty is what we're talking about, kind of like replacing a hip or a knee. The shoulder is no different. Um, the shoulder is unique in the sense that um, it's uh, it's it has the most degrees of freedom of any of any joint uh, in the body, and the reason why is because uh, it's it's you know this highly unconstrained joint uh, by the bony anatomy. It relies on the soft tissue to to stabilize the joint. That's the rotator cuff, right. uh, as well as the ligaments of the shoulder. So rotator cuff problems uh, can exist uh, you know, independently, and they can also exist with arthritis. And then you can also have arthritis without rotator cuff problems. So you know, there's a lot of different options for the shoulder, depending upon you know, what the individual patient has going on with them. Um, and there's two different types of shoulder replacements that, that are traditionally done that I do, and that is uh, an anatomic shoulder shoulder replacement. Um, and then a reverse shoulder replacement. I can get into the differences on those and sort of some of the newer techniques uh, that we use for those as well, if you want. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what would be, as, as a physician looking at a, a patient, is there one that seems to, as far as the outcomes go, is there one that seems to do a little bit better than the other, or is it patient dependent? Yeah. On I'll tell you the best. The best uh, outcomes uh, are for an appropriately indicated surgery. So, like you know, you're going to have your best outcome with a surgery that is that is chosen properly for you. So, not everyone will do better with one versus the other. It really depends on your pathology. Okay. Um, and it, it comes down to the rotator cuff. It comes down to whether or not you have a good functioning rotator cuff. If you've got a good functioning rotator cuff that's strong and pretty, pretty much free of significant disease. Um, uh, an anatomic shoulder replacement is going to be a great operation for you if you've got bad shoulder arthritis. And I'll explain what I mean here. So this is a shoulder model, and you know, if we're talking about an anatomic replacement, I'll actually use this one. This is our, our uh, I don't think that'll sit back on there, but I'll okay. hold it. So that's the um, humerus. Yeah, this is the humerus, and this is the scapula. So an anatomic shoulder replacement uh, recreates the natural anatomy of the okay. shoulder. Okay. So when we do an anatomic replacement, or, oops, loose model. Um, we're replacing the ball on the humerus with a metal ball. So here's a, here's a metal ball, and this is a stemless uh, system. And then we also have a stemmed system here. Um, so you can either have a stem that goes into the bone or something without a stem. You get to the same place, but it's a different technique. Um, and you put a metal ball where there was a, a bone and cartilage ball. And then the cup side, or the glenoid side, um, is, a, is a plastic cup uh, instead of uh, the native bone. And what you're doing is you're resurfacing the joint. So you're resurfacing the ball side and the socket side. And this construct right here, this surgery, it's dependent on an intact rotator cuff. So the rotator cuff muscles live on this bone, the scapula bone. They live over here and then they connect to the humerus. And what they do is they lock this fulcrum. So they will keep this locked right here so that you're able to raise your arm up like that. If you don't have an intact rotator cuff, this head will slide around and, and be sloppy and, and it'll bang into this other bone here, the acromion bone over here in the coracoidal, but it'll, it'll hang up on these bones. And actually there's not a rigid bone that's normally here on this model, but, um, and the shoulder won't work well. You won't be able to lift your shoulder up like that. Your arm won't go up because the mechanics of the shoulder are altered. Um, if that's the case, if you don't have an intact rotator cuff and you have shoulder arthritis or you have something called rotator cuff arthropathy, which is arthritis from not having a rotator cuff, um, a reverse total shoulder replacement is the is the operation for you, and I'll show you what that looks like. So we'll switch out our model here, and it's called a reverse total shoulder replacement because the polarity of the joint is reversed. So essentially, we take the socket side and we put a ball there, and then we take the ball side and put a socket. And what that allows us to do is achieve good shoulder motion um, without uh, without a rotator cuff. So. 
we, by putting this glenosphere or this ball on what is traditionally the socket side, the normal anatomy is the socket side, um, and then putting um, our, uh, our cup on the humeral side, it allows the deltoid muscle up here to be able to take over and raise the shoulder. So you can have rotator cuff tearing and do this surgery and your outcome could still be quite good. You could have no good. rotator cuff. You could have zero rotator cuff, a rotator cuff that is essentially non-functional in patients right. with very profound rotator cuff disease where they've had long-standing rotator cuff tears, rotator cuff atrophy, a rotator cuff that for all intents and purposes doesn't really work. Um, and it'll allow them to go from a place where they're doing this with their shoulder and they cannot elevate it to right. getting above the horizon line and getting their arm really up above that 90 degree mark so for me, it's important for a patient who has rotator cuff arthropathy or a really bad rotator cuff um, that doesn't function well and can common in arthritis, where they're doing one of these and they just can't get their arm up um, because the rotator cuff doesn't work for the reasons that I, that I said. And I get them above that 90 degree horizon. And I get them to the point where they can get something off a shelf. They can Big reach deal. that, you know, the, the, the cabinet above their refrigerator. Sure. They can, you know, simple things. They can get their arm into a sleeve better, things like that. They can yeah. touch their face. The old jacket it. thing. And yeah, that's a tough move. <laughs> yeah, even even with even with a reverse, you know, with an anatomic shoulder, that rotating behind the back is you, that motion's a little bit better because the rotator cuff is intact. Patients that have um, that have a reverse typically don't get really good behind the back motion. That's just something that. Uh, based on, on the nature of their pathology, we can't really recreate. So I always tell patients that, you know, um, reaching behind their back may not get any better uh, with a reverse, but it's already bad right. in a lot of those patients. And the goal really is to get them good forward elevation. And this is a motion called abduction, where we get them sort of out here, right, instead of like this, you know, right. where, they, where they can't do that. And that's that's the goal of surgery. That's the, that's the improvement that we're looking for. And... Uh just for our viewers, there's a rotator cuff and then there's a rotator cup. And people kind of get confused and the, and the rotator cuff is actually more yeah. than one muscle. The rotator, the rota yeah, so the rot when people say rotator cuff, it's actually a misnomer. They're, they're referring to the rotator cuff. Um, I guess the labrum is... is yeah, the labrum, the labrum is a separate structure, right. um, which, which does, um, that's the, the labrum is, uh, is, is we don't really have a labrum on this, but if you can kind of think about the edge of this glenoid right here. So this is the cup. This is the plastic cup that we put in when we do a shoulder replacement. And if you look at the rim of this, that's where the native labrum sits. So right. The labrum is kind of like the bumper on a pool table. Right. It's a cartilaginous ring uh, that deepens the socket and confers some more stability in the, in the native shoulder. Um, the rotator cuff, uh, uh, here, I'll pull this off. And we can kind of talk about it. So this is the scapula. Um, the rotator cuff muscles, there's, there's four of them. Um, and essentially, without getting too deep into the anatomy or the, the specifics, they live on this bone, both on the front and the back. Um, and they fill out these, you know, we call these the, fo the, you know, the fossa of the, of the scapula. So this little space right here is filled with a muscle. Same, th same thing in the front and the back. And they live here and they kind of cross over. The tendons come over and they attach to the humerus. And again, what it does is it, you know, if my fingers are the tendons and my hands are the muscle, what they do is they keep the head centered on the cup and allow that arm to really rotate. Right. Um, and those four muscles working together stabilize the shoulder. And typically people will have a tear in one or more of those tendons right. um, that forms the rotator cuff tear. Some more common than others. And it's a fairly shallow joint anyway, so you really... Yeah, people think of the shoulder like a ball and socket. It's not. Yeah. Um, the hip is more of a ball and socket. The shoulder, it really looks like a golf ball sitting on a golf tee. Oh. If you want to think about it like yeah, that. Yeah, that's so great. If, if here's the glenoid right there, that's your golf tee, and then there's your golf ball, and it really just sits on top of it like that, and there's not a lot of bony support, right? So the it's a very shallow, small cup, and the head is big, and we really rely on other factors to, to stabilize the, the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint, and that ends up being the rotator cuff muscles. Those are the dynamic stabilizers, meaning they can like change their length and change their characteristics to stabilize the shoulder. And then there's the ligaments of the shoulder. And the ligaments right. are uh, more static stabilizers. They, um, they don't really change that much, but they're very important to stabilize anything. So we talked a little bit about the carpal tunnel, mm -hmm. um, but in your uh, shoulder replacement, I assume it's done in a surgery center under general anesthesia, mm -hmm. uh, a little more involved and recovery a little longer? Yeah, on a that surgery as well. center or a hospital. Sometimes okay. inpatient, sometimes it requires an inpatient stay for a day, depending upon the patient, depending upon their medical issues. 
Um, it's typically performed, it, it is performed under general anesthesia, typically with a block. So okay. most patients will get a nerve block, which decreases their need for anesthesia during the procedure. Uh, it, it helps with their post-operative pain. Um, usually they're numb for a couple of days afterwards. Right. Uh, so it really helps with that. Um, some patients, appropriate patients, can be done in the surgery center safely and then discharged the same day. Uh, kind of like people who've had hips and knees done in the surgery center, same idea. Nice, nicer thing about the shoulders, you don't walk on your arm, so you, you can have it in a sling. Uh, it's a little bit easier to, to sort of get out of there if you have an ambulatory surgery. And recovery time on that, is, is, I know it's yeah. pa patient dependent, it's, but it's... I'm, yeah, it is patient dependent, and it's really how you define recovery time. What I like to say is that, you know, by about six weeks, patients are feeling pretty good, you know, using the arm, you know, for a lot of activities of daily living, um, you know, kind of kind of really starting to move it a lot more. Um, and then at 12 weeks when they come back, they're pretty happy. You know, they got pretty good motion overhead. Their pain is, you know, minimal at that point. Is physical therapy something you, you utilize with the... Uh... Not typically. Okay. Um, so physical therapy is, is not necessary for, for every patient. Um, it is for some, mm -hmm. um, especially if people are having some difficulty on their own. A lot of patients typically will have uh, just, you know, a therapy instructions that are given to them. We, we have them do some pendulum exercises where they're Home exercise. Yeah, rotating the arm and then using the arm for activities of daily living and really avoiding certain things is important. So if you have an anatomic shoulder replacement, we have you avoid certain certain activities because we repair the tendons. So we want you to, we hold you back a little bit more. So the anatomic shoulder replacement is a little more restrictive in its post-operative restrictions. Right. Um, the reverse is not. The reverse, they can kind of do most things pretty quickly. So they, they're, they're in a sling for a little while, but then yeah, they can start. Weeks. Okay. Sure. Um, is there anything else uh, that you do for shoulders? There's something called PRP out there. Is that something that you've heard about? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I used a lot of PRP um, previously uh, in my career. Um, Would you tell people what that is? Sure. Yeah. PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. Uh -huh. uh, it's an autologous uh, preparation that comes from the patient, meaning it you know, comes from your own body. So PRP uh, is uh, acquired by doing a blood draw. Um, and uh, we, we draw your blood, we spin it down, and uh, the liquid uh, portion that comes off of that is the PRP, it gets prepared. Um, and then we will uh, re-inject that for certain, uh, certain conditions. It's typically uh, indicated for things like tendinopathy. So okay. like patellar tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, it's been used for, it's been used off-label for some other stuff. And the idea there is that it, it, it contains the, um, sort of these healing factors uh, that sort of uh, help to coerce along, you know, soft tissue uh, healing. Do you, have you had some success with it? I uh, typically don't, you know, I have uh, previously. Okay. Um, uh, I, I don't really use it that much now for a lot of the stuff that okay. I do. Prior to being an upper extremity surgeon, I was a, a general orthopedic surgeon. I took care of more lower extremity stuff. I took care of, you know, uh, Achilles tendons sure. and tower tendons. And now I focus more on the hand. Um, and there's limited indications uh, for it in what I do right now. But, um, but I, I certainly have had some good experience with it in, in limited fashion previously, but now it's not really a big part of my practice. So 3D printing is something that I've heard or read about. Is that something that you think is viable for the future for some of what you're trying to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's actually a, a new shoulder system uh, that's on the market. It's a relatively recent entry that the components are actually 3D printed, so um, uh, every component is uh, 3D printed in, in the factory where the where um, the company makes it. So there are, there's a lot of uniformity there uh, okay. because they're able to really you know highly control exactly what the implant looks like, uh, and the bone in growth surface is 3D printed. So it you know theoretically makes it uh, makes it more a more successful in growth surface uh, surface. Um, currently, there's 3D printing uh, technology for um, really complex shoulder problems. So if you've got a really arthritic shoulder with a lot of deformity, some of the companies that I use will 3D print uh, a custom jig uh, oh, wow. that allows us to really place our hardware in a better position. Um, so what they, what they do is they'll actually take your CT scan of your shoulder, which will look like this uh, in a 3D model, and then we'll upload it to a computer system that allows us to virtually uh, position the implants uh, preoperatively. So I do that for most of my patients. So I'll take your CT scan, I'll upload it to this program from the manufacturer, and it allows me to sort of move this stuff around in virtual space in the computer program. Um, so that's not 3D printing, but that's uh, essentially like a 3D technology that allows me to preoperatively plan. And then if necessary, if you've got uh, a pretty complex shoulder, we can 3D print a jig 
uh, that I can actually use sterile in the operating room that'll allow me to place your 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 hardware in an operable position. Wow, technology. Yeah, I think the next step is going to be more three D printed implants uh, right. and more uh, more customization. Where it's it's more like the uh, joint that. God gave you, you know. It's yeah, more. well, for for highly complex joint pathology, there are there are custom implants, and these are these are very specific things. I use them um, a couple of times in my training. Again, these are these are rare cases uh, that 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 luckily because it's, it indicates people have really bad pathology. But in rare instances, you know, we have to take somebody's CT scan and and create a custom implant where the metal is actually formed to their deformity right. um, because they have such profound bone loss um, and that's something that is a combination of 3D printing and uh, other types of fabrication technologies from the company where they come up with a custom implant for you. Have, have we gotten any closer to cartilage regeneration? Is that no, something that's not really? You know, yeah. Not what's, really. what's your opinion about that? With, uh, it'd be great. I um, mean, uh, stem cells and stuff. I mean, are we? Yeah. There's currently no. There's nothing that's that, to my knowledge, that is that is uh, currently. Uh, is that a holy grail kind of thing? If if a doctor could. Yeah. Help. Well, the person that figures that out will be wildly successful, right? So, um, <laughs> there's a lot, You know, I did I did some research on this back when I was in medical school uh, about you know what happens to cartilage or post traumatic cartilage loss, um, and really that's still a nut that people are trying to crack. Um, there's real, there's nothing that is, that is FDA cleared to use in the United States, uh, that can restore cartilage in, in arthritis. You know, we can do cartilage restoration procedures, certainly for traumatic cartilage injuries. So this is the young athlete that has like a big cartilage flap that gets knocked off because they have an injury. We can do cartilage transplantation. Um, there's some technologies where we can harvest their cartilage from a non weight bearing part of their knee and we can either reimplant that. In a, in a different part of the knee, like take a plug and put that in, um, or we can harvest it, send it off to the lab, have them grow it, um, their own cartilage in the lab, and then reimplant that patch. Um, those are some things that I've done previously, um, but nothing nothing to the point where we're injecting <laughs> something and it's kind of growing back cartilage. It's 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 a hard problem because you have to understand that when a joint the dis, the joint destruction that takes place with arthritis happens over decades. And it's not just that the cartilage is gone. The cartilage is not just scraped off like a road that needs to be repaved with a new surface of asphalt. It, the, the joint mechanics are altered as well. There's deformity to the joint. There's osteophytes. The underlying bone underneath the cartilage is changed. There's subchondral cysts, meaning there's holes in the bone that are filled with fluid. It's a spectrum of different problems that is not just addressed by by putting the cartilage back. Now, I mean, who knows what the next 20 years are gonna are gonna show us. You know, there may be some crazy technology that like I can't even possibly think of right now that, sure. that will allow these cells to, you know, reprogram themselves and become young again. That is, there's nothing on, on the near horizon that I'm aware of. That any, anything comes close to that. Well, it's good for me because that would put me out of business as an orthopedic surgeon. Joint that, replacing joint that would be okay though. No, it'd be good for patients. It'd yeah. be great for patients. You know, it'd be awesome. For, but for humanity's sake, that would be, be great for wonderful. humanity. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that would be... Uh, do you do any techniques for the thumb arthritis? Yeah, there? absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I do a couple of techniques. Um, you know, we can start off with non-surgical things mm -hmm. such as, you know, bracing, anti-inflammatory use, uh, steroid injections work well um, to sort of you know, buy people time. Right. Ultimately, arthroplasty for the thumb is the is the, the surgical choice. So, and there's a couple of different techniques that you can do. So, taking uh, the arthritic bone out and creating a space, which is called an interposition arthroplasty. Um, that's that's something that I offer. Uh, that's kind of more of a more of a gold standard treatment. There's mm -hmm. there's other implant options. Um, there's a, a metal implant option that. Works well at preserving grip strength for the right patient. So if you're kind of a young, younger person with thumb arthritis and you you still need to rely on grip strength, when you have that thumb bone taken out, um, sometimes you don't have good grip strength afterwards. Your pain is relieved, but sometimes grip strength is is a problem, and that's not typically a problem for a lot of patients that don't r rely on it. They just want the pain gone, and that's that's a great surgery, and I do mostly that surgery. Uh, sometimes, you know, again, for the right patient, replacing that thumb, the, the arthritic joint with a metal implant can relieve a lot of their pain and still preserve their ability to grip. Great. Obviously, we could go on and on. There's a lot of things we could do. <laughs> we could also, and again, we could have another, we could have another session where we cover other things. That you Absolutely. Have. But I, I know you're a very busy person, but anybody out there that 
has some of these issues that would like to talk to Dr. Marwin, we're going to put all your information yeah. in the description below this video so sure. they can find out where you are and who the, uh, they need to contact. So all that will be there. Yeah. But, my my uh, website is a great option. So the, the Blue, Bluegrass Orthopedics website has all of my, my contact information on it. And then there's another website, uh, Dr. Marwin CTR. So just Dr. Marwin, M-A-R-W-I-N, and then CTR for carpal tunnel release. Okay. Dot com. That's another great website to use. So. Okay. So we'll have all that information yeah. for you to get in touch with Dr. Marwin. But uh, thank yeah. you so much for your oh, time. My pleasure. Listen. Thanks very much for having me. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah.